Our next speaker is an amazing writer, Jeffrey Mason. Yeah, let's hear it, Jeffrey Mason. Jeff uh, actually was educated, well, he's a lifelong vegetarian and vegan for many years as well. He was raised vegetarian. Uh, he's got a PhD in Sanskrit from Harvard. He was professor of Sanskrit at University of Toronto. While he was there, he trained as a Freudian analyst. Uh, he graduated as a full member of the International Psychoanalytical Association. He became project director of the Sigmund Freud Archives in London, well, I guess, and around where Anna Freud was alive at the time, the Library of Congress and so on. He published a collection of letters by Freud that sparked intense controversy in this psychoanalytical field. And uh, that's a whole nother life and a whole nother set of books that he's written and a fascinating story. And you may have read it about in The New Yorker and, and other places and so on. But uh, Jeff turned to animals in uh, the 1990s and his focus in, in books. And uh, he wrote a book called When Elephants Weep, which was a huge international bestseller about the emotional life of elephants, which and profound. Um, he's also, uh, another has a tremendously popular book called Dogs Never Lie About Love. Just ask Oprah, who's had Jeff on uh, and uh, moves a lot of books, right? That doesn't hurt. So uh, some of the, the he's, he's got, I think, seven titles about animals now, The Nine Emotional Lives of Cats, uh, along with The Fable of the Cat Who Came In From the Cold, The Evolution of Fatherhood, uh, writing about the emotional world of farm animals, The Pig Who Sang to the Moon, and that's what turned Jeff vegan. Um, uh, lately, he wondered why animals did not engage in genocide and wrote Raising the Peaceable Kingdom. He's written an encyclopedia of his 100 favorite animals called Altruistic Armadillos, Zen-like Zebras. And uh, his next most recent book, which is really good, is the face, on your tr uh, the face on Your Plate, The Truth About Food. And we have the book here, and Jeff's going to be signing it afterwards. It's an amazing book. It's really great. Um, he, uh, his most recent book is, what, Dog Make, Dogs Make Us Human, which came out, I think, last year. And he's working on a new book, or he's finished it, I guess, it called Beasts, What Animals Can Teach Us About the Origins of Good and Evil, which is the, also the name of this talk today. As they say, he's a prolific writer. He's a highly energetic, incredibly creative thinker. And the term joie de vivre was invented to describe Jeff because he sees joy in everything, truly. And so, anyways, all the way from Auckland, New Zealand yesterday to be with you today, please welcome Jeffrey Mason. Thank you, Jeff. It's, it's always so wonderful to see Jeff and his marvelous family, and <clears throat> I, I didn't expect that joie de vivre, but it applies to him and his wonderful family as well. When you heard about those Monday evenings, we all thought, I want to be there. Um, so I, I, I left Sanskrit because it felt pointless to me. Uh, I've published 27 books, but only three have had any potential to change people's attitudes. The Assault on Truth, about psychoanalysis, When Elephants Weep, and The Pig Who Sang to the Moon. In these three books, I had something new to say. Dogs Never Lie About Love sold a million copies, but every person who loved a dog already knew everything I had to say. And that's the same true of the cat book. The new book, this one, is more important to me because all my reading life, I've been puzzled and disturbed by the human capacity for evil on a grand scale. My first real exposure at intellectual debate came in 1963 when I was 22 and a sophomore at Harvard studying Sanskrit, and I read Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem, the subtitle of which infuriated me then and still does today, a report on the banality of evil. With beasts, I was able to think about the Holocaust in both a wider context and with comparisons taken from the natural world. One personal puzzle was clearing up for me. I loved animals so much because they were not men. I should say humans, but actually I really do believe genocide is a male problem, primarily, just as serial murder and sadistic torture is. What is new in this book is the sustained attempt throughout the entire book to look at human evil in a cross-species perspective. 
I don't believe anyone else has attempted this in such detail. So the fact that this is a first attempt means it is unlikely that I will have succeeded, but if I inspire others to take up these essential questions, I will be satisfied. I feel this book is my summing up. I'm not sure at 72 to be able to write many more books and wanted to set down what really mattered to me. Um, so, here it goes, and I, I warn you, this is controversial. Uh, I say some things that make some people very upset. Um, it began, the, the title was originally not Beasts, but something else, as you'll see in a moment. But it is important, my publisher chose it, it it's not a bad title, Beasts, because this is the word we use, as you know, to denigrate other human beings. He is a beast, we say. Uh, a new book that recently came out by David Livingston Smith, professor of philosophy at the University of New England and author of Less Than Human, Why We Demean, Enslave, and Exterminate Others, says his essential thesis is this, thinking about your enemies in subhuman categories, by that they mean animals, is a way of creating a mental distance, of excluding them from the human family, it makes murder not just permissive, but obligatory. We should kill vermin or predators. Now, it is strange when you think about it that people use the word vermin and predators so casually in such a negative way, and that's what we're gonna be exploring here. So, I'm just gonna show you a few images and ask you What, well, you know what those are, right, obviously. Um, he's Australian, I'm sure, <laughs> orcas. So what do these seven animals have in common? Predators, good. More than that, they are, what kind of predators? I'm looking for one word. It was the title of the book, and my best friend in the world, Daniel Ellsberg, said, Jeffrey, what does that mean? I've never heard that expression, so my publisher was there and heard that and took it off. Said, if Dan Ellsberg doesn't know the word, you can't use it. <laughs> and it's true, but half the people don't, have never heard it. So what is the word I'm looking for? Apex, thank you. Apex predators. These are apex predators. These are the, the very top of the food chain. That is, that no other animal will ever attack any of them as healthy adults. So, apex predators. So what do we do to them, and what do they do to us? And the origin of this, um, I'm, I was trying, I'm still trying, to find out around the world how many of these apex predators do humans kill every year, and how many of us do they kill? It's a very difficult thing to do, so if anyone has any ideas, I'd be happy to hear it. But basically, there's a tremendous gap between the number of them we kill and the number they kill of us. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the, the, the movie Grizzly Man. Do you remember with Timothy Treadwell? Um, there's also a wonderful... Um, man by the name of uh, Russell who has worked with, with bears and just recently, I don't know if you heard a few weeks ago, June, the famous research bear who wore a bright red collar um, and was working with Lynn Rogers, a great bear researcher. He would go out walking with her periodically to learn about bears, totally wild bear, and a hunter shot her just a few weeks ago. Um, it's, it's horrendous. All right. Um, so bears, wolves. We kill approximately 5,000, and they... You know, of course, the statistic, the famous statistic, um, in, the, in North America, only two humans have ever been killed by wolves, ever, in North America. Um, Strangely enough, many people are terrified of wolves. There was um, 
David Hume, the great English philosopher, wrote, it cannot be disputed there is some benevolence, however small, infused into our bosoms, meaning humans, some spark of the dove kneaded into our frame along with the elements of the wolf. So whenever people wanted to describe terrible humans, and they still do, man is a wolf to man. Um, so we've used this word in, in, in terrible ways in Norway, where uh, nobody has ever been injured even by a wolf for the past 200 years when they had a survey and asked people, what is the thing that most frightens you in the world? They said, wolves. Weird, isn't it? I mean, that, that phrase alone could make a whole book. Why are we predisposed to believe these strange and awful myths? Humans and the big cats. Now, for the big cats, there, there are more because they're formidable. Um, I know only one story where a big cat acts like a human, and that's a new book called The Tiger, a true story of vengeance and survival by John Vaillant about a Siberian or Amur tiger who when wounded by a hunter finds the, hunt, the hut of the hunter, sits there for a week awaiting him and when he returned, he killed him. And when they found the remains of the hunter, they put it in a small envelope. That's all there was left. Um, the author says this was vengeance killing. And um, we tend, certainly I do, tend to think of vengeance as a human trait, not something that exists in the animal world. On the other hand, he had it coming. <laughs> um, and, you know, I mean, it is possible that cats are different. I live with cats uh, and dogs and rats and other animals, and cats, cats are strange. Cats, <laughs> cats are strange. And um, I mean, I, you know, you, the, the phrases sometimes you hear, cats are stone cold killers. What is, what is that supposed to mean? Doesn't mean anything. But I, I do give my cats uh, a different kind of respect than I give my dog. Um, and, you know, they often jump up on the bed to sleep with me, and the dog's always there. And when they're about to jump off, sometimes I'll restrain them and say, don't go. And it's like they turn to me and say, fuck you. <laughs> and they go. <laughs> Sorry. I... You can't do that in New Zealand. I'm from New Zealand, and when I gave this talk and I mistakenly said something like that, there was this, <gasps> from the audience. You're not... So, but Jeff did warn you. All right, so... Um... And there is the, there's an, uh, uh, a fairly recent book that's actually quite interesting called Man the Hunted, Primates, Predators, and Human Evolution. And one of the things he points out is that the only animal that really predated on humans, well, there were, um, there were snakes, but rarely. I mean, obviously, we're not part of their diet. And um, there were the big cats especially leopards, and that humans, before they even had speech, the first words probably were words to indicate big cat, snake, and then, oh shit, eagle. <laughs> because eagles were also uh, taking humans. Um, but I don't think it was a very common kind of thing. Now, what got me to do this book originally, well, no, coming to that, but Humans and crocodiles, this is really interesting because there are a hundred, what is that, no, 10, 10 million? One, One million, sorry. One million deaths a year, and they kill something like a hundred. In Australia, where they're, they're terribly feared, it's something like two or three people die because they go swimming where their big signs do not enter the world. Crocodiles, and these big Australia, and they go and they get killed. Um, but. And there is a fascinating, if, if we had a lot of time, I would read it to you. There was a, a, a feminist professor of philosophy by the name of Valerie Plumwood. Write her name down, and when you go home, look it up on, on the internet. It's the most incredible story. She was taken, she was um, a researcher 
in, uh, near Darwin in the Kakadu National Park looking at Aboriginal cave paintings. And um, it was a very lonely, isolated spot. And the ranger came by and said, you know, be careful when you go into Alligator Lagoon. Why they call it Alligator Lagoon? I know they don't have alligators. And I, I think it's the Aussie sense of humor. But anyway, she did go in, and he left, and she was all alone. And then she noticed a stick following her, and the stick had big eyes, and she was attacked by a large crocodile, and he took her under for the death roll, and she came up, miraculously survived. He did it a second time, she came up. He did it a third time, and she came up, severely, severely wounded, and then he left. I guess he figured it's not gonna work, and uh, she managed to claw her way up the bank and took her two kilometers into town and was six months in the hospital, and she wrote this incredible account of it um, that I really recommend that you read. She was a vegetarian before and is a vegetarian after, and she absolutely refused. Her first words were, don't go after this croc. Um, but, I mean, she had no business being there, of course. But now, you know, all of us think, and, and I, I, we spend a lot of time in Australia, and when we see a sign saying crocodile, of course, we don't go near the water. But I was wondering whether there is any possibility that this has a historical explanation. Um, because most people would say, well, no, crocs, they're just like that. They have these teeny little brains. They don't, actually. They have quite advanced. They're, they're, they're much more like birds than they are other reptiles. Uh, they make wonderful mothers. They're even good fathers. They're extraordinary animals. But they don't seem to have a whole lot of respect for humans. But I think, there, I, I came across a really strange article in a scientific journal called Oryx, and these were some German scientists who were following up on the hint of two uh, French teenage tourists who had been in, in Mauritania, in northern Africa, uh, in the desert, and had um, been visiting a small village there, and they saw the Nile crocodile. And the Nile crocodile was supposed to be extinct in Mauritania. So these German researchers went there. And sure enough, they found this small village with what's called a little guelta, a little um, air, it's really an oasis. And they reported that there were these crocodiles. And then, as an aside, they mentioned, strangely enough, the people do their washing right next to the crocodiles. And the kids are in the water and um, splash around in the water, and nobody has ever been attacked by a crocodile. So I called these people, uh, these Germans, and asked them what their explanation, and they said, we, we don't have one, but the village has a mythology that if they ever harm a crocodile, the water will dry up. And if the water dries up, they're dead. So nobody has ever harmed a crocodile in hundreds or thousands of years that that village has been there, and the crocodiles return the favor. They have never harmed a human. So if we didn't have people like Crocodile Dundee run, running around the world, maybe Australia would be like that. Um, sharks. A hundred million a year we kill. Right? That is a hundred million. And though the, what those are are Shark fins, that's the main reason they're being killed uh, at that rate. They just, you know, pull them on board, cut the fin and throw the shark back, and the shark has a horrendous and slow death from drowning. Um, it's, it's just a terrible thing. And the re Oh, by the way, be before we leave that one minute about crocodiles, why do we have so many deaths? It's not that people go out and kill them, they're farmed. They're farmed. In many countries, especially Australia, they have crocodile farms. And what are they there for? That's right. Horrible thing. I mean, the only person who needs a crocodile skin is a crocodile, right? I mean, humans don't need those. Not even Oprah, remember when she was in... Where was, I shouldn't say that because she was so sweet to me, but, but she, she, there she was shopping in 
uh, in Zurich, and it became big news because when she went to buy a crocodile bag for $38,000, the salesperson said, dear, you can't afford that to Oprah. And, well, it is funny, that was the news, but nobody pointed out she shouldn't be buying a crocodile handbag. Right? Pleathers, fine. Cloth, cotton, anything. And she probably has 2,000 of them at home anyway. All right, so. Um, sharks. Now, most of the, most, a lot of the deaths originally of sharks came because of that terrible movie, Jaws. And you know, at the end of his life, he apologized. And he said, I'm really, Peter Bench said, I'm really sorry I wrote that. I was wrong. I did not understand. I have a, a great quote from here. Let me see if I can find it. Um, just before he died, he says, I can't possibly, I couldn't possibly write Jaws today. The notion of demonizing a fish strikes me as insane. The shark is an isn't, isn't that true? The shark in an updated Jaws would not be the villain. It would have to be written, well, he means he or she, right? <laughs> As the victim, for sharks are much more the oppressed than the oppressor. I mean, that in a nutshell is, is yeah, isn't that a great, uh, I like it very much. And then what got me to do the book was this that orcas, who are in the ocean, the absolute supreme predator. They are the equivalent to humans on Earth. Um, and they have killed zero humans in the wild, ever. And we kill still, and this, very hard to get that information. I got it from the world's expert who compiled it, a, with great difficulty, but it turns out we kill something like 1,400 of them every year of orcas, this incredibly complex, uh, emotionally complex, highly intelligent animal uh, who has never killed a human. And, you know, you, when I saw that, when I realized that was the case, I started wondering about it. Why not? You know, what is it about orcas that stops them from killing us? Actually, I don't know the answer, but they don't. And the exception, of course, as you all know, is when they're taken into aquarium where they have no business being, right? I mean, you're putting them the equivalent of a bathtub. I mean, it'd be like, you know, putting a human in a bathtub for 25 years and seeing if he goes psychotic. Yes, he will go psychotic. And that's what happened to Tillicum. At SeaWorld, he killed Don Branchow because he was going mad there. Had no business being there. Should never be there. All right. Um, so, what do we... Now, if I were to ask you, you all know the answer. I, I thought it would be a trick question, but what is the main... Or who is the main predator of human beings? Uh, yeah, see, you all know that. Other human beings, not animals, not other apex predators but us. So what do we humans do to one another? Um, now, I, I, there was one thing, I, uh, I will bring it up because in case you have some ideas of it, one of the things I wanted to write about for those statistics and, and the chart was how many animals, how many apex predators kill other apex predators of their own? Uh, every year around the world. I could not get any statistics on that. I just couldn't get figures. So if anyone has any ideas, it would, be, it would make an interesting parallel. My own suspicion is very, very little, but can't guarantee that, and I, I don't know how one would find out. So what do, what do we do to one another's absent from all other species? Well, the answer is that we kill our own on a massive scale and are capable of unimaginable cruelty. And this, I realize, is not pleasant, but you know, it needs to be seen and thought about in comparison with animals, which hasn't been done. That, you know, is, the, is, is Vietnam, this is the Warsaw Ghetto, this is Abu Ghraib, and this is Pol Pot. And there are no parallels to this, nothing remotely like it. And 
I did mention this to a few scientists who got very annoyed and said, well, that's because we're so intelligent. <laughs> they don't have the brains to do this. I'm glad you laughed because I was, I was just speechless. What do you say to someone? I say, you really believe that? Um, now, here's a trick one, but my favorite of all of them. This is the heart of the book. What does that figure stand for? Think back to what I was just talking about. 200 million, those are the number of humans have been killed by other humans in the 20th century alone. 200 million, as opposed to the other great supreme predator in the world is the orca. How many orcas have orcas killed? None. There is no known case of an orca ever having killed another orca in the wild. Now, isn't that extraordinary? Again, I don't know if we know why or have the brain power to figure it out. <laughs> I imagine if we could talk to orcas, how come you've never killed one another? They look at it, what? <laughs> why we haven't killed one another? No, the question is, why do you kill one another? You remember the great Nietzsche saying, um, uh, the question is, do we believe that animals are moral beings? But the more important question is, do animals believe we are moral beings? Answer, no. <laughs> Evidence all over. All right, and you know, I have talked a little bit about the Holocaust, and it is an obsession of mine, although I don't know why people, when you're interested in something and they're not, then they say you're obsessed with that topic because they're not interested in it, but um, I'm very interested in the Holocaust. And Yehuda Bauer is the great, probably the greatest living historian of the Holocaust at Yad Vashem in Israel, and in his latest book, which just came out, he said this, which I thought was really quite amazing. Humans, all humans, are the only kind of mammals that have within themselves the potential ability to annihilate their own. And he's very old. I'd like to get in touch with him and ask him exactly what he meant. I hope he means what I think he means, but maybe he did mean that we have the technology purely to do it and other animals don't, but I don't think so. I think he was talking at the moral level. Um, so what do we do to these animals that they don't do to us? Well, that's the first thing. We hunt them for pleasure. And somebody will say, well, don't they hunt too? And the answer is, of course, they hunt not for pleasure, but to eat. That's how they live. Now, um, Marty Keel, who, who died last year, who was a very close friend, a lovely, lovely vegan. She was a raw food vegan who started um, Feminists for Animal Rights, once pointed out to me this, that when we talk about, we're gonna talk in a minute about charismatic megaphone. I always like that term. I mean, it is, you know, these big animals that we, we tend to love. They have charisma. And then I thought, you know, when you see this so often, this phrase, nature red in tooth and claw. A little bit like beast, he's a beast. Oh, well, nature, you wanna to go to nature, nature is red in tooth and claw. So Marty, when I mentioned that to her, said to me, I'll give you a figure, you like figures. What do you think this means? Another trick one for you. 90% versus 10%. Does anyone have a, an idea on this one? No, I didn't think so, I didn't. 90% of all mammals are herbivores, just like you and me. And only 10% are carnivores. And these are the charismatic megafaunas, so giraffes, uh, who are, by the way, very powerful animals. Um, they tend to be left alone, even by the apex predators, because their feet are so big um, that they can decapitate a lion with one kick. They don't, and they just avoid them. But avo and of course, elephants. And again, if we had more time, I would tell you about my wonderful encounter with an elephant who almost stepped on me to death because I entered her living room and tried to talk Sanskrit to her. That was really dumb, really dumb. Hi, Bobo Gajendra. And 
the fuck? <laughs> Get that. All right. And, and of course, uh, up until very recently, thanks to Diane Fossey, we thought um, of the gorilla. And th th these are the blue whales, right? The largest animal that has ever existed on Earth. A hundred, a hundred. It's not a blue whale? Oh, dear. Oh, well, thank you. See? Correct that right away. But I wanted to show you a picture of blue whale just because they're so immense. Um, amazing animals. Charismatic megafauna. But I, all whales are, actually, too. Um, now, here's another question for you. Is this... You know, I often get accused of being anthropomorphic because I like dogs so much and you know, ascribe all these wonderful traits to them, which are real traits. We'll, we may get a chance to talk about them. But and I'm sure there's a better quote, if any of you can find it. There's so many nasty quotes about gorillas up until very recently, the most dangerous animal in the jungle. I'm going to change that because that's from the, from the film. That's a clip from the film. But I've since learned that there's a much better clip with David Attenborough playing with uh, wild gorillas, r rolling on the floor with them. So I will change that. But that is Sigourney Weaver in what was the name of the movie? The, uh... Yeah, Gorillas in the Mist. All right, V.S. Pritchett used to be one of my favorite short story writers. No more, because he says this stupid thing. <laughs> this is an animal who is massive and dangerous. The brutal stupidity viciously sees his victim and chases him. He's a beast with only one idea at a, one, at a time. Who is that? Well, it should be us, that's right, but it's not. He's referring to bulls. No, exactly. That's all you have to say. No. <laughs> Thank you. And there, in a, a bull in New Zealand, um, where I live in Auckland, we, we go walking through the park, a, a beautiful park next door to us, and there are lots and lots of bulls who lie down, and my sons have specialized in getting them to come over and sniff their hands, and peaceable creatures. Now, I won't, I won't, th this turns out to be false. <laughs> but when I put it up, I thought it was real. Um, that's a real quote, but it's not from Alvaro Muñera, who is a ex-bullfighter from Colombia. And he gave it up uh, at a moment like this, but this is not that moment. This went viral on the web and turned out not to be true. Um, this is really a moment just before the bull is about to be killed. And it really is a way of mocking the bull, not of saying, oh my God, what, ha what am I doing? Which would be the appropriate thing. How many bullfighters have ever done that, we don't know, but very, very few. Um, you know, they, I mean, we call it a bullfight. They don't even, at least they have the grace not to call it a fight. It's not a fight at all because of the horrible things they do in advance to the bull, which you know, they put Vaseline in their eyes so they can't see. They put cotton wool in their ears so they can't hear. They stab them over and over and break their neck. And they torture them before they put them in. And they say, look how brave we are. And the bull, of course, is stampeding to get out. He just wants out. That's why they make it round, so he can't see where he came in. It's just horrendous. Now, do you, do you know this, the battle at Kruger? Again, write it down. It's really fun to watch. Uh, it's an amazing video seen probably now by 100 million people. But what it is is the um, lions take down a small buffalo and the crocodiles try and take it away and don't succeed. And then suddenly the herd of buffalo, like 10,000, are running away. And it's like, you know, WTF, boom, they turn around and they go back. And the, <laughs> you get these the, 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 the lions looking back, what are they doing? Why are they coming back? And then they realize they've come to get the little one. And they do. And they, this, this huge bull just throws two of the lions up in the air. And the bull miraculously survives. And it was caught on an amateur seven-minute video. It was really worth seeing. Um, and we like that. But, you know, when I looked this up, when I was looking up, I mean, the comments are terrible. There are something like, what, 47,000 comments. And, you don't want to see what teenage boys write about things like this. <laughs> but um, even National Geographic had a, a cover story called Eternal Enemies, Lions and, and Buffalo, Cape Buffalo. Well, of course they're not enemies. The whole idea of enmity is a human notion, isn't it? Now, Stephen Hawking uh, recently said this, 
because they asked him whether he thought in, what is it, uh, I think it's a trillion, I have the quote that was given to him, something like 10 trillion, no, a trillion billion, a billion trillion, that was it, a billion trillion stars in the known universe, is there likely to be uh, life? And he said, of course, there has to be. But <laughs> would we want to meet them? If they came down, what would they do to us? And you know, we like to believe, all of us in this room, and, and certainly so many people I know, want to believe that there is such a thing as moral progress. I don't know. And, and I, I, it seems to me possible that there could be incredibly advanced civilizations, technologically, that are no more advanced morally, that are not at the level of dogs. You know, dogs are very high morally. When I look at Benji, I was telling Jeff at lunch, my, my golden lab, about whom I wrote the book, The Dog Who Couldn't Stop Loving, appropriately enough, and he loves our rats, and he loves mice, and he loves birds, and he loves, he plays with the chickens and the rabbits and, and everybody. I don't know a single human being as nice as Benji. I really don't. And um, was it Michael Clapper said, we wouldn't need the United Nations if the whole world were filled with Benjis. Nobody would be harming anybody. So it, it does seem to me that there can be this profound disconnect between a certain kind of intelligence and the ability to think morally. Now, here we get into the, the, the controversy. How did this happen? And, you know, the truth is, I don't know. Nobody knows. But there are some ideas. And... Um, some of you may be familiar with Jared Diamond, not my favorite man. I don't have very many favorite men. Most of them are here today. But, uh, Jared Diamond, definitely not be among them. But he did write one extraordinary article, which you can read on the internet at any time. And it's called The Worst Mistake in the History of the Human Race. And that is, for him, agriculture. That's right. Um, and the reasons he gives, I won't go into it because um, it's his article and he's entitled to get all the credit for that. Actually, he took it from other people, which is one of the reasons, without saying so. But it's an interesting article, and you should read it. Um, but I believe, and, and I'm also not the first to say this, although maybe the one trying to do it in the most elaborately, but uh, James Mason said this, and actually Paul Shepard said it. Um, but even more disastrous in its consequence, leading us as a species toward violence, cruelty, and destruction is this. Now, these are all pictures from New Zealand, where I live, and doesn't look too bad, does it? So what is that? That is animal domestication, right? And these are the main species that we have domesticated just shortly after we started agriculture. But if we stopped there, and if we had said, look, it's really nice to have sheep wandering around, and let's domesticate them and make it easy for them to live around us. We'll protect them from other predators, we'll make sure they have food, we'll give them veterinary care. It's one thing that humans do that other animals don't. Elephants don't have veterinarians for humans. Um, we do. But then they don't put us in zoos, right? All right, so. If we did that, and if we had pigs, because pigs are such wonderful animals, there's every bit as intelligent as dogs uh, or humans, and they would love to sleep on our bed if we'd allow them. I've been for many a walk through the woods with, with pigs. They love it. Um, wild pigs are very easy to become familiar with. Uh, and the same, of course, with cows and chickens, even more so. Uh, I've lived with chickens. Chickens love to, my chickens, it was a disastrous experiment, actually, because they insisted on watching me write my book. So they sat on the computer, and you can't housebreak a chicken. You can do everything, but you can't housebreak them. And my wife got fed up. She said, that's enough! <laughs> also, it got dangerous because they felt that they were entitled to do anything we did. So when we walked on the beach, they would come for a walk on the beach with the cats and the dogs and the rabbit. And it's dangerous because it's not our beach, it's a public beach. And <laughs> dogs say, look, chicken's on the beach. <laughs> So, the domestication of animals. So, if we did that, and if we did it not because we want their fur, 
Uh, we want their skin or their flesh or their children or their eggs or their milk, but because we liked having them around, they were friendly with us, we were friendly with them, we created a kind of peaceable kingdom. That would be great, but that's not why we domesticated these animals. We only did that in two instances, and that is cats and dogs. And we didn't do it, they did it. They chose us. Cats decided to hang out with us, or our, our choosing still haven't decided one way or the other. <laughs> but, but dogs definitely, and dogs have been with us now, it's absolutely certain, for at least 35,000 years. And if you think about it, we have been a modern homo sapiens sapiens, has been about 50,000 years. So during that, almost that entire time, we've lived with dogs. So dogs are very, they understand us, they're, they're similar to us, they have the same emotions that we do, they understand our emotions, they care about us. Um, so it, it, in, in those two cases, it's been somewhat successful. Although, as all of you know, we also do terrible things to dogs. But it leads to the domestication of animals, and normalizes intensive and exploitative practices such as these. And this is what you see now commonly, and I deliberately did not choose the most horrendous photos, but you know, this is live export in Australia, where these sheep are being herded into these boats. You can just imagine, I mean, the sheep have never, don't belong on boats, obviously, and they're in terror the entire time, and they stack them up, and it's horrendous to take them to Saudi Arabia so they can be slaughtered by the Saudi Arabian manner. It's just, it is insane, literally. Uh, and then these are the way pigs are being kept today uh, around the world. These are dairy farms, and they're, they're even worse than that. And this, these are not, I want, wanted to use chickens, but these are actually turkeys. Um, and it gets worse because once that becomes normal, then why shouldn't you do this? This is a zoo. Um, zoos are an abomination uh, stain on the earth. They should be abolished completely and totally, all of them. Um, it's another zoo. This is a bear bile farm, which is a, a horrendous practice in Vietnam and China where they keep the bears for up to 20 years and every day they, this painful procedure of taking out their bile because they believe it's going to make men more um, fertile, which is a bad thing anyway. And, and there you have, uh, that's a picture of tilicum from blackfish, which I haven't seen yet. Uh, I'm going to see it um, in Berkeley tomorrow, so I'm very excited to see it. But uh, as you notice, you know, the, the fin there is that, uh, has just completely collapsed, which shows that they're not healthy. Obviously, you cannot keep an animal that size healthy in, in a bathtub, you just can't, and they have no business being there. All right, so is this not an opportunity for profound reflection on our relationship with the natural world, thinking about this? That's what I used it for. And what I, I again, is not the best shot for this because in fact, is a famous photograph just taken a few months ago, uh, which went around the world. And this is an uncontacted tribe on the border between Brazil and Peru, Manu Park, uh, National Park. And these, th these are uncontacted hunter-gatherers. Now, as hunter-gatherers, which we were until um, 10,000 years ago when we started our uh, agriculture and the domestication of animals, it is true, I would love to believe that there were hunter-gatherer vegans, but there weren't. <laughs> there definitely were not. I, you know, I've, I've asked a lot of older Maori men whether they knew any in New Zealand, you know, the indigenous population were Maori, did they know any vegans? And no, of course not and the same in Australia. Um, so we didn't, but the amount of meat that was eaten was very, very small, um, because it was dangerous to go out and hunt. And most of the food came from women foraging, and there was no such thing as warfare. Uh, never mind genocide and torture and all these things we know about. Warfare started, what, about four or 5,000 years ago. The so warfare as we know it today did not exist during most of our history. So it's not true that we're, we're incapable as a species of having lived differently. It is a question of 
contingencies, things that happened in our history. And to prove that, I wanted to show you one of my favorite, I remember, I suddenly remembered it and packed it on at the end, but when I was studying Sanskrit, one of the things we had to learn was a, a language called Prakrit, which is a kind of more plebeian version of Sanskrit, and um, Prakrit was a language in which these inscriptions were made uh, by a king known as Ashoka. And he had the, the largest empire the world has ever known in ancient India, about 250 BC, before the Christian era. And he is the only king who ever wrote something like this. He wrote it uh, in this Prakrit language, which was only deciphered in about 1922. They were able to see he wrote it on these big, huge slabs of rock. And he wrote this, that he feels bad about having killed all these people. Um, which is an extraordinary thing for an emperor uh, to say, the only one, I think, ever in history, which means it can be done. And what's particularly dear to my heart is that he went on and said this, uh, formerly in the kitchen of beloved of the gods, King Priyadarshi, and that's Ashoka, hundreds of thousands of animals were killed every day to make curry. But now with the writing of this Dhamma edict, and he was the one that promulgated Buddhism in India, and there you, that you, there you see those edicts. And they'd been known for hundreds of years, but nobody could decipher them until an English linguist, James Princip, did so in 1920. Uh, but now with the writing of this Dhamma edict, only three creatures, two peacocks and a deer are killed, and the deer not always, and in time not even these three creatures will be killed. I, what an extraordinary thing that he made that connection between killing humans and killing animals. And he did it in, you know, 384 BC. And it, nobody's ever done that since. So it does, it, it gives me hope because it, it means we're not completely doomed as a species. I mean, I don't believe we're going to get back to, to being hunter gatherers or even to doing what Ashoka did. But what is the word that joins those two great insights, not killing humans and not killing uh, animals? It's a, compassion. compassion, exactly. That's the word I was looking for. In Sanskrit, they have the word ahimsa, which means literally not doing harm, not harming, but compassion is even better because it's not, not just doing the harm, but um, um, doing something good instead. So that is my outrageous uh, talk and an outrageous book to follow soon, uh, coming out in March. And I've rushed through it instead of giving you a lot of quotations because you are an audience that um, I know will be sympathetic to this, unlike many of the others where I'll be giving this talk. And I wanted to leave time for questions and comments, and I already got a good comment that I had a humpback whale, so I have to change that. But, you know, comments, criticism, questions, um, concerns, anything. Yes? I just uh, returned from Uganda for 30 days, and uh, we were on a boat, and we saw a little primitive village, and they were living with the crocodiles, all in peace. Really? Wow. Yes, that was pretty cool. Please do email that, that to me. Um, my email, for anyone who wants to um, email me, it's Jeffrey Mason, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-M-A-S-S-O-N, at Paradise. No, sorry, I'm getting rid of that one. Um, <laughs> because it, people keep sending it back, unacceptable, because they think it's a sexual come on. Paradise, oh wow. So. <laughs> I, I, I lose a lot of emails, so I've changed it. I have a Gmail, Jeffrey M. Mason at gmail.com. It's crazy, isn't it? An email address that we will not accept this address. So yes, I'd like to hear about that. I, didn't, I, did, I did find one other reference to some place in, in um, Africa where the same thing happened. But it's fascinating, isn't it, to think that if we left them alone, maybe they would leave us alone. I had a question about baboons. I've heard that baboons in the wild are, can be quite violent towards each other, and I, I was wondering what you knew about yes, that. Yes, it's true. I was talking, what's his name, Sapolsky at, at Stanford about this, um, and he, he said that they're incredibly 
uh, vicious to one another. But when I asked him about the figures of death, I said, how many die? He said, we don't know, but not many. So, I mean, animals can be vicious, of course, toward one another. And even, you know, I, when I was talking to all the orca researchers, I said, you mean orcas never attack? I said, oh no, they attack one another. We just don't know of a single instance where they actually kill one another. So, I, I believe, you know, Conrad Lorenz was a very strange man, apart as well as being a Nazi, as we recently learned. But he did have, in his book on aggression, he did have one idea, and that was that um, animals learn ritual submission. And you see this all the time with dogs and even cats, that they fight up to a certain point, and then one of them loses, and if the dog had put their tail between their legs and they slink off, and that's the end of it. You know, it, it rarely ends in death. Um, and and that's, you know, that's part of that key question. Why do we, as a species, carry it to that point beyond where the person has surrendered? Okay, I give up. Yeah, too bad. Shoot. You know, we do this all the time. My lie or any, I mean, we you know, just can't pick up a newspaper in a single day and not see an act of tremendous cruelty that is unnecessary. It's not serving any purpose. And remember, you know, we're talking about predators, okay, but in every case, these animals are killing to eat, not for the fun of it. I, I didn't find a single scientist who says he knows of any animal who kills for fun. That they get pleasure doing it because it's functions loose, that's what they evolve to do, so it, it feels good to them when they're able to do it, but they don't torture. Jeff, do you want to take, yeah. Right I'd be interested to know your thoughts. There are segments of uh, so-called nutrition experts who support paleo diet eating. Who based, support what? Paleo diet. Yeah. That, that, that we were all originally hunter-gatherers, and so that's well, we've all evolved doing that, eating animals, and uh, that that was the, the natural right thing that we should all be doing even up to, till today. Yeah I, so. I, yeah, I totally disagree with the paleo diet. Um, and I think there's a, an excellent criticism. Am I right, Jeff, on, on, by T. Colin Campbell? Uh, well, there's a few different ones. Dr. McDougall has McDougall, uh, that's a great right. Sorry. Yeah. talk about uh, that we were gatherers and hunters and that mainly we were gatherers and every now and then opportunistically. That's right. That sort of the, anyways, there's a, that's a whole other topic and there are some interesting talks on that that uh, perhaps I'll highlight in a future new Veg Source newsletter. But remember, too, that we are the only animal who gets to choose what we eat. If you think about it, there's no animal in nature that, you know, you don't get a shark, it's just, the hell with that, I'm going vegan. It, it does, <laughs> doesn't happen. And you don't find elephants who suddenly, you know, decide they're gonna eat other animals. I mean, they eat what, they, what every other elephant eats. But we get to choose, and we have this tremendous variety. What about uh, dolphins' aggression towards sharks? Towards sharks? Well, you know, they're protecting themselves. I mean, dolphins are part of the diet of sharks. I mean, sharks as apex predators, I mean, I'm not sure really what sharks eat, but they eat practically anything they want. Um, but, but even when an animal eats only what it wants, it still has certain restrictions. So dolphins being, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to say more intelligent because that's a very contentious term, but it does seem to be that they are more intelligent than sharks, and they don't appreciate it when sharks attack them, and so they protect themselves. And it is true, I did talk to a number of dolphin experts about whether uh, sharks ever protect humans. They do. And um, their explanation, the, the explanation of the, um, who was the famous guy at, um, at uh, not Santa Barbara, at... Um, University of California at Santa Cruz. He was the great dolphin expert, and I talked to him about that before he died. And he said, yes, it definitely happens, but only by mistake. They think that the humans swimming are baby dolphins. Come on, <laughs> come on. A dolphin doesn't recognize the difference between a human and a baby dolphin. Of course they know we're not baby dolphins, and they protect us anyway. So I said that to him, he said, okay, then it's instinct. Well. 
That's not a bad instinct, instinct to protect small, helpless things. I'll go for that. That's great. <laughs> but it's not true, obviously. They're smart enough to realize, well, you know, that the, the shark shouldn't be eating that human, and we're going to help them. And there was a case recent, just a few months ago in New Zealand where six swimmers were swimming, and a great white suddenly appeared. And they said, oh, shit, you know, we've had it. And at that moment... Um, a, uh, a pod of dolphins came and put themselves between the sharks and the shark just gave up. So clearly they were protecting the humans. But yeah, they're aggressive to sharks, uh, but I don't know if they've killed sharks. Certainly their intention is not to kill a shark. The intention is leave me alone. Hi. I am a science teacher at a parochial school, and I don't know. <laughs> Trust That's me. That's the end of that I know. question. <laughs> <laughs> um, middle school science teacher, and have presented in my science classes um, some of the things that I've read Dr. Furman, Dr. Esselstyn, uh, Dr. Clapper. I use your video in my classes. And, <laughs> um, and after teaching these things, I have had two experiences happen. One, I've had students say, oh, yes, well, but the Bible says, you know, we can eat animals, or um, I have their parents coming to my classroom. Why are you teaching my child this? And I'm just wondering, what do you think would be a good response for that? Because it's very tricky, and I find that I have to really reserve myself. There's a, and there's I just a say, wonderful, <laughs> there's a wonderful book. Um, um, I hope he's not in the audience right now, but um, Bush's speechwriter, <laughs> of all people, I think Jeff knows him, uh, wrote a book called Dominion. And it's really Matthew Scully. It's really an extraordinary book. He is a right-wing fundamental, fundamentalist Christian. But it is an extraordinary book. It's, it's the best written book in this field, much better than my books, called Dominion. Absolutely. And he answers that question, exactly that question, in great, great detail, far better than I could. So it's something you want to look at and be prepared. He also has a very, very good uh, article in the National Review, just... Um, not something I read, of course, but he, he sent it to me. We're still semi-friends. We broke up our friendship over Sarah Palin because, <laughs> well, no, really. Really, he was her speech writer. You remember she gave one great speech. Well, she didn't do it. He did it. And I called him up and I said, Matthew, how could you do this? I mean, he loves wolves. There's a woman who gets in a plane and shoots wolves. He said, yeah, that's terrible. Um, I said, but then how can you support her? And, you know, so it really led to a break in our friendship where we're trying to renew it. I mean, it's important to be able to be friends with people who don't... Otherwise, we could never eat anywhere, right? Because... <laughs> <laughs> can't eat with friends, because very few friends are vegans, alas. Yes? Hi. I was wondering if you're familiar with uh, Daniel Quinn and his writings, Ishmael and some of his other writings that he's uh, uh, written. Daniel Quinn? I, di I didn't hear that. Daniel Quinn? Are you familiar with the writer? The one... Um, he wrote Ishmael, and he's also written some other uh, books that deal with some of the issues. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody told me the last time I gave a talk, I said, you've got to read Ishmael. And I had trouble reading it, so I didn't read to the end. So I can't, I really can't speak to it. And I am trying to remember why it was so difficult for me. Uh, Ishmael. I think it, I tend not to be a very spiritual person. So, because I, I wrote a book called My Father's Guru about growing up with Paul Brunton, who was a, one of the first gurus in the West, and I just hated that experience. So, um, it's made me very uh, frightened of, of spirituality ever since. So, I think that's what it was with the Ishmael. Uh, hi, I uh, noticed in your, the title of your talk was talking about good and evil, and yet uh, aside from a little preamble in the beginning about how evil men can be, that you really didn't uh, develop that theme too much. Uh, just basically the idea about animals don't seem to act in good and evil ways, but men do. Uh, so I'm kind of wondering how you're going to judge good and evil, especially with your comment that you're not a spiritual guy. Yeah, well, I judge it historically. So in the book, unfortunately, there are far too many references, and I tried to keep it out of, of the talk, 
to human evil. Or, you know, I look at a lot of maybe seven or eight different genocides. Um, my publisher kept saying, stop talking about the Holocaust, especially when you talk about animals, because a lot of Jewish survivors, um, I was married to one, so I know how sensitive this is, um, really don't like the comparison that uh, is, is sometimes made between the Holocaust of humans and the Holocaust of animals. But I, I believe there really are deep, deep parallels there. So I do look in great detail at, um, at human evil. But to be fair, I also have an appendix where I mention some of the things that some humans do that uh, doesn't seem to be common in the animal world, such as hospitals. Ashoka, by the way, was the first person to uh, build an animal hospital, a human hospital and an animal hospital, right next to one another. And I, you know, I think that's wonderful. I think we are capable as a species, some of us, a few of us, of rising beyond our own history and, and doing things differently. Whereas again, and it is intriguing, this notion that, that animals tend to be more similar. You know, that, 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 that elephants or tigers pretty much resemble one another. You don't find a, an elephant saint and an elephant uh, pol pot. You know, you, unless we've created it. By the way, that's a wonderful book you all should look at called Elephants on the Edge. And they discovered this horrendous case of wild male adolescent elephants raping and killing rhinoceroses in southern Africa. And um, Gay Bradshaw, a, a scientist with a PhD in psychology and a PhD in zoology, decided she wanted to find out why. And she went and she found the answer. These were animals who were present when their mothers were slaughtered. They actually were there. And then they, they escaped and they formed these little gangs, thug gangs of males who were, had never learned what it's like to be an elephant. You know, there was no large matriarch to say, that, 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 that elephants don't kill, elephants don't rape, we don't do that. And they went wild. But it's a human artifact, you know, it's a human doing something. And in any case, there was, I thought you were gonna raise the question of the dolphins not just being aggressive, but actually killing uh, porpoises in San Francisco. And I raised that with Gay Bradshaw, and she said she looked into that too, and it was absolutely a case where humans had been um, bothering them in all kinds of ways, and they lost their, their cultural knowledge. See, I do believe that every animal society has a culture, just as we do, and you grow up in that culture, and you learn to be a tiger or a lion or any of these other animals. How are we doing? I think we're almost at the end. Does anyone... Time for a few more questions. You can object. I'm, I'm desensitized to that because, um, you know why, should I tell you? Funny story. When I uh, wrote The Assault on Truth, which was my experience as a psychoanalyst and why I left the Freudian world and why they were wrong about child sexual abuse because Freud first claimed it was true and he was right and then he took it back and said, no, no, it's just all fantasy of women. And when I found all these documents when I was with the Freud archives and talked about it, you can imagine it didn't make the Freudians very happy. And the first talk I gave was uh, in Vancouver, and I couldn't believe it. I'd never talked to more than about three or four people, and suddenly there were 3,000 people in the audience. I said, gee, they really love me. No. <laughs> no. Time for questions. First question. I Sandy, you know, can't wait. Jumped up. He said, you would admit, would you not, that you are the number one asshole in America today? <laughs> and, you know, I, just, I went like that. And the audience stood up and cheered. <laughs> Psychotherapists. <laughs> So, what I mean by that is, don't worry, you can insult me. And you can say, come on, Mason, this is just ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, but, you know, give me some data, because... Uh, and do, do email me, I would love to hear some, you know, sometimes you don't want to criticize me in front of everyone else. Um, but if you do have some criticism, or you have some, you know, like you did, thank you, um, 
the wrong slides or better slides. These are not, I've asked Susan to help me with this. These are, uh, I have a young friend who just got all this on the internet for me. So it's not legal, really. It's legal for me to talk about it, but I can't publish it as is because I just downloaded them. But I'm sure they're more powerful ones. Well, yes? Do you think if animals that have a similar diet, if one a small baby is adopted by another species, the young one will grow up with the morals or whatever of the adopted species? That's a good question. Um, you know, there, some, somebody sent me something a couple days ago on the net called 27 Examples of Animal Adoption, where animals, but most of it was cute as opposed to real. Um, but there are instances where animals will adopt other animals. Uh, I don't know, these are all domesticated, I don't know if it has ever happened in the wild. I suspect not. Um, for a while, I was interested in wolf children and came to the conclusion that it is a fantasy, that wolves have never raised a human. Um, well, I mean, people, people thought it was true for a long time, you know, Amala and Kamala, and I mean, there are always uh, instances of this, but all the ones I investigated turned out not to be true. So I don't think in the wild that any animal will adopt an, uh, an animal of a different species. If they did, what would they be like? That's a good question. I don't know. Yes? I'm just curious if you've uh, read into Phil Zimbardo's work on the evil of humans and if maybe... Whose work? Phil Zimbardo, the Stanford study. Yes, yes, Zimbardo, of course, yeah. Um, I was just kind of thinking that maybe the fact that humans have a higher incidence of killing each other or other animals and stuff might be essentially because we have opposable thumbs and higher intelligence. That we have a what? Opposable thumbs and higher intelligence. We have the technology to do that. Yeah. Because even Jane Goodall has shown that in um, like the studies with chimpanzees that they have the internal battles and stuff. And it might just be that you know, they have the same aggression issues, but we have the ability to do something with it. Yeah, I, I do have a chapter in the book about so-called chimpanzee warfare. And um, Richard Rangham, who's the person who began this theory and, and talked about it in great detail, and I have gone back and forth. It's not the same. It really isn't. I mean, chimpanzees, first of all, they've only seen, you know, a small number of this. I think in all the thousands of hours, they've seen like something like, I'm not sure the figure, something like 26 instances where they do raids. Um, but as for the technology, you know, Sarah Hurdy, who is, is marvelously intelligent, has a new book called Mothers uh, and Others, where she talks about the importance of mothering in animal society. She begins the book, which is the only thing I didn't like about it, everything else is wonderful. She begins the book by saying, what would happen if baboons were, she says she takes, often takes airplane rides, and she's always amazed at how how cultivated we all are. You know, hello, nice to meet you. You know, we don't start punching each other out. Um, unless you're a movie actor, sometimes they do. But, but generally, we behave well. And she said, imagine putting um, baboons on a plane. And uh, when the plane landed, you know, there'd be limbs cut off. But I thought, that's a really dumb thing to say because baboons don't fly in airplanes. <laughs> and how do we know that they wouldn't, if they had to do it every day, learn how it's done? The truth is that they manage to live with one another without enormous killing. I mean, there's no such thing as genocide. Remember that no animal species is ever engaged in anything remotely resembling genocide. And we do. You know, how many, I mean, how many wars something like 3,000 wars in the last 400 years. I mean, 3,000 wars where we go after one another, and often genocide is the point of it. That's what we want to do. Yes? Yeah. Okay, we've heard a lot of problems, especially with humans, and um, there's uh, a lot of people that say, well, the reason is because we have a problem with morality, and they go out and they preach morality, I don't think that's really the solution that we, we can come up with. I mean, to me, it's what we're eating, what we're, you know, how we're raising animals, how we're treating these animals, how, how we see us as different than, than them. Could you enlighten us as to how we can make this a better place and how we could save the human race? 
Well, obviously, I, you know, I agree with you. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we can, <laughs> but I, I, I do wonder, I mean, I, I can't say, you know, there have been plenty of awful vegetarians and, and there are plenty of wonderful people who eat meat, so um, I don't know any, but... <laughs> <laughs> But, I, you know, I do wonder what would happen if the whole world were vegan, would, would that affect morality? Well, I like to believe it would, especially if the reason were not just health. And by the way, you know, here I am at a, at a health um, conference, and I totally agree with everything you've been learning and hearing about. 100%, I think it's wonderful and marvelous. Um, it's, it's not the reason I got into this. I got into it because of the moral issues. I felt it was simply wrong to take the life of an animal simply for the pleasure of eating it. It just never made sense to me. And that may be because I was raised as a vegetarian, so I've been vegetarian for 72 years, apart from a sinful few years at Harvard, uh, <laughs> where stupidity overcame me in that citadel of learning. Um, so I'd like to think, you know, that, that, that if the whole world were vegan, there would be a difference. And somebody raised, uh, oh, yesterday somebody asked me the question, well, what about animals that kill one another? Don't you think we have an obligation to stop them? Well, we do, actually, with domesticated animals. We don't, um, we don't like it when our cats, I mean, I love cats and I live with cats, but I don't, if I can stop them from hunting, I stop them from hunting as does just about everyone I know, even though it's part of their nature. Um, so, you know, we do feel, I mean, even people, I always find it a little bit odd, because even people that eat meat think it's wrong to see a cat hunt. And I always think, why? If they're gonna eat meat, why do they think it's wrong for their cat to kill? Um, I wonder, now that's a good question to ask a hunter. I don't talk to hunters very often, so if any of you talk to hunters, ask them if they think it's okay for their cat to kill. And if they say no, then why is it okay for you, you brute? <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeffrey Mason.